Hi, this is Igor from hdhand.com. We're going to move on pretty quickly because we don't have much time to address this subject. It's not really complicated, but uh, it does take a little bit of uh, brush up on color theory. So we'll look at some basics first and then we'll see how all that applies in Avid DS. In imaging, a LUT is a tool that we use to convert images from one color space to another. So what is a color space? In this example, the image on the left, for simplicity, we'll say that it's an sRGB color space, although that, that's not entirely correct, but it, it doesn't matter. And the image on the right is the representation or translation of the same image into a very limited color space that's uh, similar to something of, of a fax machine. So let's work backwards. What is a color space? A color space is a color model with a strictly defined gamut. And what is a color model? A common color model used in computer imaging is RGB or a common color model used in color printing is CMYK. It's nothing but, but an abstract way of thinking how color is mixed from its primary elements. We can create a hypothetical color model consisting only of two primaries, yellow and blue. So this color model consists of two primaries, yellow and blue, and any color that can be created by mixing these two. In this example, we're talking about subtractive color mixing, which is a type of mixing that happens when you mix paint. So mixing yellow and blue is going to create green in between. When does a color model become a color space? Let's say we have two cans of paint, yellow paint and blue paint. Those two primaries are defined by what's in the can. The paint is perfectly mixed. It's not going to get any more yellow, any less yellow, any more blue or less blue. It is what it is. So, so, so those are our two primaries at their uh, highest intensity. And we said this is subtractive mixing, so we need some sort of surface to paint this on. So we paint on a, a white stucco wall. Now we already have the elements that define this color space. We have the, the known yellow paint, we have the known blue paint, and we have the known white stucco wall. The way these colors are going to look on the wall will depend on many factors. And in fact, this example is probably even more complicated than what happens in uh, digital imaging because there are many physical and chemical factors at play. But the density of the paint will determine how translucent the paint is, which will let more of the white wall to shine through or less, or uh, it will de depend, you know, the chemistry of the paint will de determine how the paints are mixing and creating the green paint. The color of the white wall also plays a role because if this wall is rather dark, then everything we paint is going to be pretty dull until the uh, the buildup of the paint is thick enough where we can start seeing the pure primary color coming out. So now you're getting a sense that how from a purely abstract way of thinking of, of a color model with two pure paints, now we're talking about color space where these real physical factors come into play and determine what the color looks like. So we start painting. Here's blue. We're building up more blue and then yellow comes in and where they're mixing you start seeing green and so forth. The good thing about color space is that it ensures that results can be reproduced. A color model can't really do that. I can't call, call up someone on the phone and say, hey, uh, mix 40% of yellow paint or 60% of blue paint or whatever and uh, expect to understand what the results will be because I haven't told the guy what kind of paint we're talking about in the first place and what we're mixing on. But if I call some guy and say, hey, go to the store and buy this particular type of uh, sheetrock and, you know, buy this uh, uh, spray paint in this can, this, this brand, this other one, mix them, it's likely that this person will get similar results to my own, even though we're not working together. And this is the essence of color management, just uh, making sure the colors are consistent across the board. So we'll go back to our example with the sRGB and fax machine on the right. A role of a LUT is to translate from one color space to another. The goal is not only to ensure transparency, but also when we're dealing with different types of devices, we want to make sure that the color is translated in some way that looks perceptually as good as it can on this particular device. And I chose the example of a fax machine because that's an extreme example of dealing with only black and white. So you immediately see the difference. Undoubtedly, you can tell that the image on the right they came from the same source as the image on the left. It's just that it's severely color deprived. And to go from left to right, we need some sort of a rule, and that rule is a LUT. Aside from ensuring faithful color reproduction when we move images from one device dependent color space to another, LUTs are also used to manage images like this where we intentionally skew color in a certain way to uh, increase dynamic range or do other things to the image, but we'll get back to that later. When we talk about device dependent color spaces, it's important to consider that numerical representation of color is entirely arbitrary. In an 8-bit color, we can assign, and most commonly it is done that way, uh, we can assign red color to be uh, 255, 
zero, zero in uh, RGB interpretation, meaning that red component is at its highest intensity and uh, green and blue are invisible. But in a hypothetical color space down below, uh, the value of 255.00 may mean an entirely different thing. It's uh, like uh, uh, measuring speed in kilometers per hour versus miles per hour. Uh, they are both doing the same thing, but they're just enumerating it differently. So we can't just take the numbers from one to the other and expect that this red will be exactly the same uh, in this color space with a question mark. So the role of the LUT in this case is to convert the red color of 255.00 to perceptually identical or close to identical color in the other color space and create these new values of lowercase rg and b. I'm saying perceptually uh, similar because this new color space may not be able to reproduce the exact color from the, from, from the originating color space. If the, uh, if the gamut of the target color space is, is more limited than, than the gamut of the originating color space, then we won't be able to do that. And in practice, it gets a little more complicated than that because of the way gamuts may overlap. So sometimes certain colors from one color space can be reproduced in the target color space, but some cannot, and the other way around. So, so you get these weird overlaps where you can kind of go one way, but not the other, and, and, and so forth. Practically, it's impossible to get exact reproduction of colors from one color space in another, but perceptually, we can get very, very close results as long as the target color space is of a somewhat wide gamut of course, a previous example of the fax machine color that does illustrate the exact opposite. The fax machine doesn't even have any color at all, so it just has black and white, so you can't do it. And also, it's important to note, when you think of the example of the fax machine, is that you can go from left to right, but you can never go from right to left because the gamut on the right is so limited that you just can't make these colors out of nothing. What does a LUT look like? It's a table, so it has a not an endless but a long string of numbers that determine what numbers become what numbers in this conversion. This is a simple LUT. There's also uh, such a thing as 3D LUTs. DS supports those as well, and those ensure higher precision conversion. Some of the LUTs that are delivered with DS uh, live in this uh, directory right here. Sometimes LUTs are not tables at all. They can be mathematical transfer functions. So instead of stringing a whole bunch of numbers together, we create a function that transfer from one gamma to another. And this is almost exclusively used for gamma correction. And what is gamma? Gamma defines the middle range, everything that's suspended between black and white in this case. Our black and white values are the same in both of these strips, but everything in between is a little bit skewed in the example below. Uh, you could say the, the top example, the values are kind of evenly spaced out, but at the bottom, they are bunched uh, towards black. For example, you might have seen flat looking images like this one. We can use either DS color corrector or any of the DS LUT tools to correct gamma like this. Why is this image looking like this in the first place? There are certain reasons that have to do with image acquisition, image perception, and image storage that determine the gamma of, of an image. Uh, but that's all beyond the scope of this tutorial. What suffice to say is that most images we'll look at are actually not linear, they're, they're gamma corrected. And maybe what's going to illustrate the best the user transfer functions, functions if we look at this plot of a linear function, y equals x, it's a perfectly straight line. Now look at a gamma corrected version of this. However, if you run this function through its inverse function, we'll get a straight line again. Uh, and this is something that's been going on in, in television since the black and white days actually but it all ha takes place behind the scenes so you don't take a notice of it only recently with the uh, digital film scanning and then with the expansion of digital acquisition formats we're kind of dealing with different types of gamma corrected images